Alright, uh, this first one's called Sandy. And I wrote it November 10th, 2012. There must be a reason that we enjoy harmonization so much. Two or more people singing on different levels, but sounding as one. It represents unification and differences. It calls out something instinctual in our pack animal DNA. However, dissonance seems to overthrow unity. It is something that most of the time is undesirable to listen to. But in the daily actions we take as a species, we support dissonance over harmony. So I drove home after visiting a friend for the weekend. I heard that a hurricane would hit, but like many others, I didn't believe what the media said anymore. I don't trust the politicians anymore, and I've lived long enough to understand that both are being run by hype and money. However, there was always that aching panic in my heart, that thing that says, maybe I should still listen. <laughs> that thing that says, don't take anything too lightly ever. So just in case the media and politicians were not lying to me, I decided I wanted to drive home, my real home, the home that my family lives in, or at least my first family. For on my travels, I've acquired more than one, more than two. Sitting for an hour at the Throgs Neck Bridge, because even though it's a state of emergency, the city still wants your money and you have to pay your toll. When I get home, my mother's happy to see me. I get the word that my father's on his way and he's bringing my grandfather because Long Beach is being evacuated. I decide to take a shower while I wait for their arrival. I think it's a little funny that we're afraid of a hurricane and I'm taking a shower. I guess water is not always just water. <laughs> I get dressed and come downstairs to greet my grandfather, whose dementia seems to be light today. He's joking around, and there are moments, loud echoes of the philosopher and teacher he once was. Moments such as him looking at the large decorative wooden bowl my mother has on the table in the den. He asks, what is the significance of an empty bowl? I look at him inquisitively as he smiles and says, what was, was. Brilliant. The next day proves to be less pleasant. I work from home until the power goes out. The storm is hitting. Later we hear on the radio the terror that this coast is going through. I hear my grandfather's city, Long Beach, the city that I lived in until I was 12. The city that has my grandparents' house, my second home, the city that has my entire childhood, much of my adolescence, and many of my adulthood memories of fun, fear, crying, safety, love, being washed away. Days later, I hitch a ride back to Astoria since I'm told work is important. Being a coder, as long as I have power, I have work. I hear of people homeless, hungry, without water, without power. No one's helping them. This was my town. This was where I lived. I hear of Far Rockaway, another town swept by water. I speak to my best friend who freely admits that if she hadn't been in New Orleans, of all places, for the last two weeks, she wouldn't have evacuated. She comes home to a wasteland. I have her stay with me for a weekend. All her possessions, all her things, all her hopes, all her memories that she worked so hard for, without a family to help, all on her own, swept by the current of an angry world that we refuse to take care of. Bloomberg wants the marathon to continue. The people in charge bring the business areas and the rich areas back to life because the rat race must go on. While those who already had next to nothing now have more nothing than they've ever not had and they're isolated and the media says it's old news and I go back to the office in Cooper Square where the rich people talk about how happy they are to be back because they were getting so sad stuck in their warm heated apartments. Dissonance is all around us now. We are so broken. The snow falls and the rich dream of the close by holidays, the winter wonderlands, sing songs. While the snow falls and the poor, the middle class, the unlucky, moan and mourn the gurgling cries of their loved ones drowning. The dissonance the waves bring, washing away the grit, only harmonizing in the depths of the ocean. Wow. This one's uh, this one's called unpolished, 
And I haven't read it that often, just maybe once or twice because I feel it's kind of unpolished. <laughs> but um, the, I just kind of got the feeling I wanted to read it tonight, so here goes. I've been getting a bit annoyed when people have been suggesting that I get out of my comfort zone. I've been diagnosed with general anxiety disorder, which makes it sound like, oh well, that's just the run-of-the-mill general version. <laughs> when actually it means that I pretty much, I pretty, I have anxiety over pretty much everything. Um, my point is that I don't have a comfort zone. I am scared of things that I do every day. I am scared to go outside some days. I am scared to even get out of bed some days because I'll have to do things figure out a way to make the most of the day slash my life. I'll have to talk to people. I'll have to try to be clear, to not be misunderstood. I'm terrified of being misunderstood. That might even be the reason why people say that I'm so well-spoken slash a good writer. I think it's because I have an insatiable desire to be clear. Because if someone goes around telling people that I said something, something that I didn't mean to say, then people might get the wrong idea about who I am and have false expectations of me, or think of me negatively for unjust cause, or, or even like me for someone that they think I am. I know I'm not the only one that experiences life this way either. I have met a good amount of people who have the same anxieties that I do, and, I, and go through the same shit. But they all seem to be people that I can't seem to keep in touch with, probably because we share these anxieties in common, such as hating talking on the phone, or making plans, or writing emails. <laughs> and so it always leads to me feeling alone. And you know what's absolutely crazy? With having all this anxiety for pretty much my entire life, I was never afraid of death. Not really anyway. Not as a real thing. Till this freaking year. For some reason, I can't stop thinking about it now. I mean, one inevitable day, I'm going to die, and there's nothing I can do about it. My consciousness will cease to exist. Everything will stop. I mean, there's a chance that there's an afterlife. I mean, maybe my consciousness won't stop. Maybe it'll continue somehow. But there is no scientific proof of that. There's scientific proof that the components that make up who I am will be dispersed into other things. But my consciousness, the thing made from those components, I think is different. I think it's what spiritual people would call the soul. I think it's what makes me unique. And I think that stops. That ends. But maybe I'm wrong. In fact, I really hope that I am because I really don't want to end. Ever. I know that's crazy. I know it's strange too. Especially since I just detailed how my life isn't all very happy and relaxing all the time. But I just don't want to end. It's not even about being remembered and living on through others. I've realized that I want to be the one remembering forever. I don't know, maybe this is a good thing. Maybe I've been depressed, and to get out of that, the first step is realizing that I want to live. But right now, I mostly feel terror about it. Which I think is leading to prophetic dreams. Dreams slash hopes that I am more than just a simple mortal human. Dreams that make me feel like that I am a hero, or I am special somehow, or that I have superhuman abilities. The other night I had a dream that I was walking down a street at night. A woman was walking towards me. She was very attractive and had long red hair. As she approached, she said, Hello, Jonathan Sherlin. She knew my full name, although I had never met her before. She said her name was Alex, and she told me things about myself that I had never told anyone, things that I could, that I could only know, things that my waking self has now forgotten. She then told me, in four days, you will make a decision that will affect the rest of your life. Four days later was this past Tuesday. I had been sick since the day before, but decided to go into work anyway since I felt a bit better. The entire day I thought that something might happen, that a situation might arise that affect the rest of my life. Even so, I realized that all choices, whether they seem big or small, can end up having a larger impact on our lives than we realize at the time. As I continued my day, I felt more sick. Finally, in the evening, I arrived at home feeling exhausted. I had been excited, though, since I was supposed to receive in the mail a new video game I had been looking forward to. I had even spent $15 extra to have it delivered to me on the first day of release, since I often work late and don't usually have time to go to video game stores before they close. 
However, I got a slip saying that it needed to be signed for and that they try again tomorrow. <laughs> this sort of pissed me off. I called the number on the back of the slip and I asked if there was any chance that I could pick it up tonight. They said yes. So I got the address and went on a half hour trek to Hunter Point Avenue to find a UPS warehouse and pick up my package. As I got off at the Hunter's Point Avenue station, I felt feverish, walking down a barren street with tall buildings at night in a fairly dark area. It felt very much like a dream. I found the warehouse, and as I waited, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had been there before. But I have no idea why, in any situation, I would have. But it just felt so familiar. A lot of the UPS workers were checking out for the night and joking around with the security guard. It made me feel comfortable almost like being at home. My father was very much a handyman who was always very comfortable around blue collar workers, although wouldn't be considered one himself. I received my package and made my way back home. I spent some time trying out my new game until I couldn't keep my eyes open anymore. The next morning I awoke with a fever and could barely function, having to completely miss a day of work. So I don't know if this day will affect the rest of my life, all I can see is that it made me more sick and confused. And none of this seems satisfying. I just wish that I felt more than fear and sadness. I want to feel calm, but can't. I want to feel love, but can't really, because I associate, associate that with fear now too. And knowing all of this, and knowing I'm, I'm going to die, it all seems so melodramatic, amateurish, teenage aches like I am far now from those teenage days. The life is murky. I don't quite know what I want or where I'm going or how not to feel scared. So when you say to me, maybe you should get out of your comfort zone, <laughs> just know that I'll laugh a little inside, maybe cry a little too, because I really don't know what you mean. <laughs>